Let's start with a prayer. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. We thank you, Heavenly Father, for this conversation. It's time to think about your law and your wisdom. May we imitate you in all things, and follow you in our hearts. We may serve you through our and you forever and ever. We entrust this time and this conversation to you through our Mother as we sing. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. 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 The Father and the Son of the Holy Spirit. Amen. So the Pope has been examining certain errors on moral theology, certain errors on the relation of law, especially concerned with how does law relate to freedom, what is the law to freedom, what the purpose of freedom and freedom for. In looking at particular errors that have been part of this around. Quoting from Sirach, you read this. God left man the power of his own counsel. Taking up the word of Sirach, the second man of the council explains the meaning of that game of freedom, which is the outstanding manifestation of the divine image of man. God will give man the power of his own counsel, so that he would seek his own creator with own accord, and would freely arrive at the total perfection that did with God. These would indicate the wonderful depth of the sharing of God's dominion, which man has been called. They indicate that man's dominion stands for serving status for man himself. This has been a constantly recurring theme in the logical reflection of freedom, which describes a form of kingship. For example, Gregor Nyssa writes, the soul, the soul shows its rather known character, and that it is free and self governed swayed autonomously by its own will. What else must be said to say the king? The human nature created as rule of the creatures with bias likeness to the king of the, the universe, may as it were the beginning. Taking the archetype of the dignity of man. So I'll we'll jump on the second and talk about a couple of things. One he's saying is that freedom, free will, is an important part of being the image of God. And having the ability to choose freely to exercise freedom, this is necessary to be made in heaven. In fact, it's a great proof that we are made in God's image. And part of being God's image, God being the king of the universe, man is a certain as a king himself. Maybe you've heard or seen where we're talking about or baptized priests, prophets, and kings. So this the bring back to this priest, prophet, and king. Priests to draw to Christ, sacrifice the Mass, prophet to speak to God, with God, and God to have to pull around us. The King, which is what John Paul II is referring to here, refers to, through Christ, this dominion over oneself, dominion over man's nature, dominion over the part of ourselves that's fallen and corrupt, and it's really the right thing. And this part of ourselves wants to wander off and do other things. And so through Christ, with His grace, we have the ability to imitate, to our self control, self mastery, and to guide ourselves for the right truth. This is all part of that original freedom, this kingship over not just the world, but over ourselves. This freedom. The exercise made over the world, speaking of the subject, represents a great and responsible task for man. What which involves is freedom and obedience to the freest man, to the earth subdued. In view of this, right autonomy is to every man, as well as the human community. The fact that the countless constitution of the Gaudium is fed is called special, special attention. This is the autonomy of earthly realities, which means that creative things have their own laws and values, which are to be either discovered, utilized, or ordered by man. 
So God himself, he says to man, fill the earth, subdue it, take care of the earth for me, steward over the earth. God is giving man a share of the earth for the God is every human being, but in very fact, a share in his creative work, a share in his task to take care of the earth, order the earth, to guide the earth. That's part of what it means to have free will, is this task. What that means then is that inherent to us as individuals, that inherent to communities and families and societies, are these same truths. That individuals have freedom that comes to their very nature. Therefore, families have particular laws that govern and guide them. They're meant to carry this out in a particular way. And so there are laws we have to discover. <laughs> This means you don't invent them, but it means that we find them in the nature itself. Uh, so there's certain things right in the heart of man. You don't kill, don't steal, don't lie, etc. There are certain things that 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 you discover and define the world about us. Other things we have to that use. There are certain laws that we discover and find and respect. Others we use to them, others we order ourselves. We take, we guide, we say we're going to use the world in a way. All of underneath God's plan and God's domain. It's the purpose of guiding order in the world itself. Don't the second simply line up principles right now, because whether it's the first gonna be glad that's good, but it's true, as it's gonna say, here's where people strike. Oh, you know, also say our principles. Not only the road left, but also by himself. Has been trust to his own care responsibility. So, that's just, so again, these laws to discover, to use, and order, this isn't just the world side of us, but also ourselves. We're meant to guide ourselves and to look at ourselves and see the way. God has left man the power of his own counsel out of the free will. <laughs> that he might see his creator and freely obtain perfection. The free will is to help him find God. Choose God, be like God, to walk with God, and love God. Attaining such perfection means personally building up the perfection of yourself. Indeed, just as man exercises the domain over the world, shapes it in accordance with God's intelligence and will. So, also performing morally good acts, man strengthens, develops, and consolidates within himself as likeness to God. You notice here that there are two different terms. Image and likeness. Likeness refers to sanctified grace. Image refers to part of our soul having the free will. When we walk with God, God very deliberately has created us in such a way where He wants us to freely choose. To be his children, do what he does, act as he does. God is very free to say, You're going to do what I do, you're going to help me with my creation. That first of all means go outside of us. Even more importantly, it means our own hearts and souls. That when we choose to good, we become good. We choose to walk with God, then that likeness to God becomes strengthened and built up perfected. So that more than good acts aren't simply. Something happened outside of us. When I do the right thing, when I speak truth, when I'm kind to other people, but only helping them around here. I'm also making myself be a good or better person. More or, like, more or less like God. When I speak the truth and help people and be kind and, and generous and honest, yes, that helps put around. Yes, that helps put around, but also makes more like God. When I am uh, deceitful and a liar and hurtful, and do bad things, I guess it harms things outside of myself, but also destroy the life of God within me. This is a very profound thing. So what it's saying is, is that by our actions, by our choices, always of course with God's help or with God, we become more like God. We can choose to become like God wrong. This is what it means to have free will. This very profound. 
very beautiful thing, very beautiful gift of God to say, you always with my help and with none of my guidance. You get to decide only what kind of person you're going to be, but you're going to decide how much you're going to be like him. It's really beautiful. It's awesome. Even so, here's the Pope, his warning against any problem on the list. Even so, the Council warns against the false concept of the autonomy of the Reverend Gallows. So everything does have its own laws, its own particular places where it is, but the false does. The false concept is one that says the creative thing are not dependent on God. A man can use them a reference to the creator. So that, in other words, I'm so free that I can invent laws. I'd simply order them back toward God and say, I'm going to use whatever I want to. I'm going to use these things as a matter to simply. I am free to do them whatever I will. But the difference between these sides is between you burn down the forest or to build it up. And there's no, there's no, I'm totally free and totally in charge. With regard to man himself, this idea needs particularly baneful effects. Eventually, it's eight. That is, greater the creature some disappears. The God is more the creature itself is impoverished. If I believe in myself, then my freedom is simply to do whatever I want to do. There's no purpose to it, no goal to it, no, no, no place where I'm trying to lead myself to let by God. First of all, it leads to structure of society. But then it's in the end with the with atheism. There's the only way to untether my freedom from the Creator. To say God has no authority over me. And once you say God has no authority over me, I might tell him what to do. And all of a sudden, then I'm saying I'm equal to God. And I'm equal to God, and God becomes irrelevant. God becomes irrelevant, God disappears. And once God disappears, all of a sudden, I'm no longer free. Because if there is no God, if there is no true freedom of creator, then what controls me is my brain, my circumstances, my nature, and I lose my freedom. And so you look at the atheist science of philosophers, and they'll make, they will deny free will. They will deny that there is freedom. They'll say so all the, cho the choices are, are truly free. Because everything else is tied down and out. And so you begin by denying our debt to God, the fact that we owe God, and slowly then end up. The atheism, you actually lose the cost of it. That makes sense? So it's kind of a complicated thing, but it is important to recognize. Very brief version of determinism. Yes. <laughs> yes. The teaching of the council emphasizes. Oh, sorry, just one thing before I add a little bit. It reminds me of so there, there was a the atheist karma, uh, it was a karma, but atheist, atheist karma is not karma. And she said you know, that, that atheists will preach that you know, we're all you know, good to each other, we're all, we're the brotherhood of man, we're all, we're all brothers and sisters, we're all equal. So the problem is that without, without the father, without the there's no brother. How can we brothers don't have the same father? If we all have different fathers, then how are we brothers? Or in the words of George Orwell, we're all equal, but some are more equal. <laughs> <laughs> Number four. The teaching of the Council emphasizes, on the one hand, the role of human reason in discovering and applying the moral law. The moral life calls that creativity and originality to the that person, the source and cause of the life. We're not trying to say that man is simply to be a puppet. God left us truly free. And then God wants us to use our reason, wants us to choose the gifts of the other wants us to, be, to use them well and honestly, understand who he is and what he's done for us, and to become more fully ourselves. 
which is not the sense we're going to have, you know, and this is why the board does not simply give us, you know, a list of rules. Where from 3 p.m. you have to do this, and I do that, six you do that, and everything's great. You could. It wants us to figure things out, to work with things, to say, but, but, but. Reason draws its own truth and authority from the eternal life. It's not about the divine wisdom itself, right? Because we're always for God. We're made on the, we're made on the image, and this is what we're trying, and we're, this is what freedom is for. And so our reason, we truly do reason that we truly figure things out, we truly discover things, we truly see what God's done. But always, it is back to God. Otherwise, we end up bosh. At the heart of the moral life, the Bible principle or life will talk. It's freedom, it's, it's, but it's right in place. The man of principle sought to actions. The moral law and its origin in God that always finds source to it. At the same time, which of natural reason strives for divine wisdom is properly a human law. How, how did John Paul II say the moral law is divine law, but also human law? Because its power, its source, its origin, its goal is always enough. That has to do with human beings directing and guiding us, therefore, it has to do with us. So, the principles of the mechanics of call, you first have to deal with the physics of the other world around us. Right? I mean, if you don't, don't deal with the actual physics and the mechanical laws and the law of nature, it is not going to work. But the particular thing you're going to apply it in a way that only involve the engine, the will, and the particular sort of combustion that make that work. So it applies to the car, but it involves the universal laws. The same thing is true of the moral. The proper autonomy is always comes back to God, comes to God, leads to God, but it's the other ones. And so it's God's law as they apply in a particular case to a particular individual person. Indeed, we have seen the natural law is nothing other than the right understanding is us by God. So God's written this, this truth in our souls to know it's right and wrong, to do good and believe. It's part of the reason every human being knows it's being done. But we can ignore it, but we also know it shows it that, do good and believe. And this itself is a share of God's own truth and God's own being, part of us to be in God's image and likeness. This is how we understand what must be done, what must be reborn. God gave this light to the law of man's creation. The rightful autonomy of this practical reason means that man possesses himself as a law received from the Creator. Nevertheless, the eternal reason cannot mean that man reason itself creates by his law. So we possess the law. But do not create the law. You can't change it. You can't decide, you know what? I don't want to put this out. I don't want to. Let's ignore this one. Somebody who doesn't believe in our religion would wonder how we make the difference between something that some man wrote down 100 years ago that was his and something that some man wrote down a long time ago that was. Yeah. So there's two things that I would say. And I would say is that when it comes to moral law, what we would say is that God reveals to us what is above our reason or what's difficult to understand. It's never a contradictory. Um, one can, through looking at the side, looking at pure reason, come to say that should kill, should steal, should cheat, be faithfully promises, uh, should obey authority, should respect those who are, who are older. That's something that we, we can reason to simply looking at the side. Um, without these things, society falls apart. And so we can say that the Ten Commandments, for example, 
You can do the by by this by a reason. But we also would say it's because you can come to a reason. The Lord doesn't leave us there. As the Lord reveals in a deeper, more expansive way, where a reason already knows. Uh, and so the thing is this. Let's say something purely pure, pure, human good natural. Calculus can be proven. Right? You're, 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 you're math, right? You can go and take principal calculus and, and prove it, work them out, and through calculus, prove. I can't. And so if someone comes tells me this is what these principal calculus mean, and this is how you know, you know, how to, you know, the Pythagorean theorem, you can prove all these things. I just accept it. Okay, whatever you say, I'm going to write the formula. Okay, okay, you got it. Because I'm not wired that way, so I probably want to figure it out by myself. The fact, the, the fact is that very few people by themselves would figure out the Newtonian calculus comfortably. Some people have. There was that young uh, mathematician in India uh, 20 years ago that, that came to the same conclusion as people just without reading it that I didn't So, it happened. There are people who are so brilliant they can, they can work those things out. Not uh, the way I'm wired when it comes to math. In the same way, there are people in the history who have proven by a reason that there is a God, who God is, that God is good, that uh, Aristotle and Socrates. Most people are going to get that because of original sin, because it makes it for the freedom and the and leisure and the, you know, the inclination to do it and to extract some other things. And so the Lord says, well, yes, we can by reason prove these things. To make it easy, to make it practical, to make it not rely upon a reason alone, but also reason to us. So, I know the difference between what is simply man made and what's divine. But first of all, the fact is what's divine is going to elevate, complete, and perfect what's human. Not contradict, break, or destroy. It's never going to contradict itself. It's never going to contradict any other kind of knowledge. Um, and so, if, if truth contradicts truth, if, if I'm doing quantum mechanics that contradict something in my will, Either my religion's wrong, or my quantum mechanics wrong. They both can't be true at the same time. Truth can't argue truth. And so I have to then be able to say that if it's become God, it has to be something that encompasses, comprehends, elevates human reason, by contradicting it, and without. Um, that's a question like maybe the ten. And <laughs> and <laughs> last I, think, I think what she was trying to ask is what's the difference between moral law and speed limits. Oh, never mind. Let's see if that's not like a tangent. So just continue. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so I started seeing your face. I'm like, maybe I think I missed your question. Just well, I Or diversity of society cultures. This sort of alleged autonomy would contradict the church's teaching on the truth of God. This would be the death of true freedom. The tree of knowledge of good being shall eat, they eat it, you shall die. When we think that um, whenever we say that. I can make a law which contradicts God. Or I say that um, I can create my own freedoms, my own I, I, um, what is this? I can create what's right and wrong for me. I, 
I can say this is why this is wrong because you voted on it because I'm the king, because I'm um, bigger than you. If I can say what's right and wrong. <laughs> no, I just had a bunch of them. <laughs> Think of numbers. This becomes then a destruction of my freedom. If my freedom is about making me like God, if it was about making me the right thing, if it was about making me truly become what's good, both of these things change, change my goal on my place in heaven. If all of a sudden I'm on my head toward God, I'm saying I'm ahead toward myself, I can't become like God. I feel like I make them like God. If I'm going to try to ignore God, that will make me get not like God. And the end, as before, you end up in atheism, you end up leading into losing your freedom entirely. Because soon as you say that we didn't choose right or wrong, we can change it because of circumstances or because we voted on it or because of the blind, because, no matter what. So you say I can change what's good or bad, so today I can kill you, or today I can steal, or today I can lie, or today I can go blank. All of a sudden, right or wrong mean nothing. All of a sudden, good and bad is <coughs> And bad was good and bad just depending upon who's in charge. Right? If we can change what's good and bad, whoever's in charge, it's a change. Very good, guys. Well, so we need to do that is go back toward our proper understanding of what freedom is and what life is. But, but yes, this, this is why it's important to know these things. Because people will say, well, I, I know that, you know, back in the old days, people were so much dumb than we are now, they used to think that murder was wrong. They used to think you couldn't lie. They used to think, but we know now you can do. And of course, they don't use the term murder because, because that's to go find some other bigger fancy words to say. Use bigger fancy words to say that sounds better. They do. Just because we know that I'm alive. Yeah, that's what well, it's done. Fancy words. Oh, okay. yeah, so, um, <laughs> we're giving somebody mercy. We are making certain that we're not slaves to our own body, to our own to, to nature. So you make it so we're making certain that we're not controlled by the past. We're making certain we're not being controlled by some wicked patriarchy. Fill in whatever buzzwords you want. You can find ways to say things where it sounds, but who wants to be controlled by a slave? Who wants to be controlled by a slave? If you don't want to be controlled by a slave, well, therefore, I'll tell you what we do that. And it goes down to is, it, is there a right or wrong beyond, beyond me? Is there a good and bad beyond me? Or can I change it because I don't want to be a slave, I don't want to be controlled, I don't want to be going back to that freedom. I mean, we might be loose from the entire thing. I mean, we don't, we don't have objective reality, objective boundaries, we don't have things beyond our own, our own minds. And whoever is in charge is how about to do it. One of the counter arguments that they've had recently with this line of thought is is society the way we should be? Is society a good basis? And so trying to base our arguments on this is what's good for society, if you assume society is not good, that's where they start falling apart. Well, and so what you would say then is um, human nature would make the science. You go back to the, you would say, say, okay, What's the deepest desire of the human heart? To love and to be in love. Prove this with a, uh, a slot experiment. Say, okay, imagine you think about you have all the wealth and power in the world, but don't care about it. You're not going to be happy. Um, and so, if we need other people, deep down, we're made for relationships, we're made for these things. Well, relationships are not honest, truthful, and good, are relationships, right? They don't miserable. 
when we're truthful and kind to each other, when we do it, then there is then, we don't steal, lie, and cheat, that it does end up a relationship that are good. And society, in the end, is made up of relationships. Society is made up of families. It's a good society. Are there bad societies? Yes. Society is based upon, you know, people with brown eyes or kangos with blue eyes can kill. Reading from the, the Clinton Daily Theme was talking about how you're, you're not born as an individual, you're born immediately with connections to others, like this relationship with the mother and the father. Like we are a family when we're born, the minute we're born, we're born into a group. Like, yeah. you don't choose it. <laughs> you don't choose your friends and you don't choose your family. Yeah. And because of that, because that is the essential part of being a human being in the first place. It's not something we say every society is perfect and then we, and then we figure out what's right and wrong there. What we say is that society has led a certain way that's meant to support these particular realities. Relationships with families. The government is for the sake of the fact, not for the way around. And the problem is, these days, we try to make it the way around, which we try to make the government in charge of that. It doesn't work. It doesn't work. If we're not support the family, protect the family, because what is the government but families working together and assigned together at a best, live and survive and flourish? Right? And this is why the founding fathers would say, you know, democracy's not going to work without a Objective right and wrong, other than slavery. You don't, you don't have objective right and wrong, you don't have a virtuous citizenship, that it's going to end up in one group, it's going to end up in a worse tyranny. It's, it's why philosophers like uh, Socrates rejected democracy. He said, the end everyone's going to be, he's not that way anyway. You need to have a virtuous king. But then, of course, they have a virtuous king, you know. Whenever this human is involved, whenever this human is involved, we have problems. Yes, the king always changes the definition of virtue. So. Well, and as long as you have, again, virtue above the king and beyond the king, that's where you start having the Magna Carta. You know, was the, it was uh, the idea of virtue above the king above the king. You know, that there's goodness greater than the king. You can't change those things. Darkness will set. <laughs> so we were a lot safe without that. Number 41. Man's genuine moral autonomy, that freedom to choose, choose, choose good and bad, freedom to choose good and bad, in no way is rejection of the rather acceptance of the moral law of God's command. Glory to God be his command. Humans' freedom and God's law are what call intersect, intersect. In the sense of man's free obedience to God, to God's completely gratuitous deference towards man. Hence, obedience to God is not a sum of belief and heterotomy, to the moral law, or some of the will of something more powerful. And the strangest man call it as freedom. If in fact in heterotomy and morality were to be a battle of man's determination, the mission of norms relating to good is to be a contradiction to the relation and covenant of the incarnation. Such a heterogeny would be nothing but a form of nation contrary to divine wisdom and dignity of the human person. Others speak rightly so of the honor. This is the honor. That we hear the word autonomy, that means law. Fancy word for law. It's Greek word for law. Theo is God, and hetero was the self law. Law, the law, the, the will above it, the greater the will above it. The only thing in God's law. Since man's free obedience to God's law effectively implies that human reason, and human to faith, God's wisdom and progress. In forbidding man to eat the tree of knowledge of good and evil, God makes it clear that man does not really possess knowledge, it's something properly his own, only he shares it by the light of natural reason and divine relation, which manifests in the requirements of the promise of eternal wisdom. 
Let me stop there, because there's a lot to unpack there. <laughs> a lot of fancy words. Um, <laughs> basically, what John Paul II is saying, if, if you don't want to think of law as God's law, it's simply God's bigger than us, so I can help with it. It's not that some people think of law. They'll say, well, God's bigger, God's the God is the creator, the creator, therefore God can say what to do. And it's not entirely true, it's because what that does is that excludes the fact that God's law are for our good, for our happiness, for our perfection. It's not going to there's something to say, I don't care about you, it's what I say, you better do it, and whatever I say goes. Now it's true once more, but it is true that whatever he says goes, it's not because, simply because he's bigger and all powerful. It's because of the fact that as God's creatures, because without God there's nothing at all. As God's creatures, what's best for us, what's good for us, is to be with God and be like God. And so when God gives us His law, He's helping us be like Him. When He gives us His law, He's making us more like Himself. He's guiding our freedom, making us more free, making us more good, making us more happy. So it's not simply that God's out there saying, I'm going to control you because I'm bigger. It's not saying, but make you happier and better and win. Exactly. Yes. And so this is what this is what it's talking about the sharing, the participation, and the union, because we're sharing in God's very life. And when God tells us all we're sharing God's wisdom, where God knows best for us because he made us, says to us, do this, and you'll be free of that. It's like if if the car had AI and had free will, and you say, okay, now the car, no, don't, don't go out in the lightning, don't go out try swimming in the salt water, don't put your in your gas tank. You know, otherwise, you're going to break that. I was like, I don't believe that, they're just trying to control me. You know, and some car would try it just because they're free. <laughs> you tell them the car, you know, change your oil, let it 10,000 miles, and then don't and only put gasoline in there, that'd be best for the car, make the car, the car better. That's kind of what God's doing with us. Okay, now this is what we do. We say, oh no, God is trying to control me. It's the sharing of his union with the love that God is up. Or you talk about heteronomy and theonomy and satisfy. Law must therefore be considered an expression of the Bible by submitting to the law who submits to, to the creator. It leads me a mark on still on these days where it's the following. <laughs> there was a pagan lawyer, the name of Cicero, King of the Cicero. You never heard him described like that? Okay, never heard him. Novel, he, well, he's, he's most famous for his um, saying, Have to destroy Carthage. Let that be destroyed. Uh, the Messiah is so corrupt, it's a so wicked, we can't, we can't make peace with him. You have to destroy him. But Cicero was a lawyer, one of the things he said as a pagan is he said that if a law is not truly about the good, it's not a good law. If the law is only going to, go to be about controlling people, or is only for the benefit of the few, or is about tyranny, I could say that on a naked law which says you have to give me hundred dollars every month as a tie because I'm special, whatever it might be. It's not a good law. In order for law to be real in the first place, in order for it truly to be law, it has to be about what's good and what's true and what's best for the human nature. This is a pagan lawyer for himself. You will be like the law, live the law. And this is what John was like saying. He says, law must be an expression of violence. So any human law we make, anytime I come down to find and make law for our family, for our family, or for our city, or for a nation, if the law is not participating in God's wisdom, 
It's not a real law. Because it becomes that harmful to human beings and to persons. It's the very purpose of law itself to elevate, to protect, and to make better. And so if the law of the nation is this group of people can be enslaved, this group of people are people can go like and have the laws be had in that. Those are not true laws in the real sense of what law is. At times we have to then uh, ignore or try to get a little trouble. You wish to help, but hopefully peaceful. Just so you're not encouraging the civil unrest. When I was sitting alongside a family, and she goes back to a black family, and I found where he was a runaway slave, and I found his restaurant for it. That's how much we've changed because I thought you couldn't find any of that stuff. Yeah. One of my grandfathers would apparently test people that do visitors with there was an old Rubens painting in the 16th century of some uh, African, the famous painting, the, the bust of an African man. Um, he used to go go in and say, oh yeah, there's, that's not, there's one from Georgia over there. Tell that was a relative of ours painted. This is easy to react. You know, if they reacted badly, you know, okay, it's not for us. <laughs> they were okay, me. You know, then you know they would be. We did a lot from George. Oh. It was a. Most of us were clear on the way, but it counts. Consequently, one must, must acknowledge the freedom of the human person, or must acknowledge in the freedom of the human, the human person the image and nearness of God, the of the wall. Must likewise acknowledge the majesty of the God of the universe, where the holiness of the law of God is going to be transcendent. God is greater than everything else. They are simple man. So in other words, looking at God is human freedom. Yes, God has given us freedom, and therefore we image God like God. And so we have the right to do that we're free and we choose for ourselves. We can't slave people, hurt people, we're truly free. But God's greater than we are. And so our freedom must be in line with them under him. Or we're saying, God's not greater than our he's not greater than me. I'm greater than God. You have to think kind of what is holiness, what is as near as you do the suffering. You ask a question, they can stop and slow us down. <laughs> Song love. Blessed is the man who takes light of all. God's freedom. Man's freedom is not negated by his obedience to the divine law. The only disobedience is combined in truth and conformity to the <clears throat> Obedience and freedom are not opposites. This is clearly stated by the Council. I hate that guy in the Council. Human dignity requires a man to act through conscience, through conscience and free choice, away, not conscience. As motivated personally from within, and not through blind internal impulse or any external pressure. Man achieves such dignity when he frees himself from all subservience to his feelings. And a free choice to good pursues the land by effectively and assiduously marshalling the appropriate means. I want to desire. Only choosing what's 
right because someone's watching me. I'm only going to do my homework when my teacher is going to check up on me. I'm only going to not steal when mom's behind me and spank my mom to know if she's catching me. Or even internally. I'm only going to do it because I feel guilty. I'm only going to do it. It's, not, it's, not, it's only about my feelings, or only about um, someone outside of me, you know, forcing me. Even doing the right thing, it's not truly good. It's not truly free. It's not truly what it's supposed to be. This is going on now to why I'm doing the right thing, not simply what I'm doing. So the fact that I'm doing, doing the right thing is good, yes. But I want to go to a place where I do the right thing even without being forced. Even without being pushed. Even without, that's what I'm aiming for. That's the true freedom, that's the true dignity. So when I conform to myself, or I act literally and freely say, this is what's true and good, I don't feel like doing this. It might be hard, it might be difficult. I might say, you know, it'll really ease me, you know, to you know, slap you know, someone in the face right now. I'm not going to do the right thing, I want to do the right thing, I'm not going to do that, but I feel like doing this. What was that? I <laughs> said, so maybe we should sit there. <laughs> 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 It's not 
prosecutable until it's over a thousand dollars. Yeah. So these yeah. big yeah. stores are keeping track of people stealing, but they don't prosecute them until right. they yeah. actually yeah. stole yeah. a thousand yeah. dollars worth of stuff. Yeah. <laughs> it's yeah. just crazy how the tags are all big stories. So they know how kids they are finding it and looking on TV in one of the shows and they got caught stealing and they're indignant that they got <laughs> 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 God has enabled man to share this divine law 
And therefore, man, able to the greater answer of God's providence, increasingly recognize the enchanted truth. So because God is the creator, because God will make all things, we can therefore understand what's good and bad based upon what is. Because everything flows from God is made by God, and God is good, we have an objective reality and measurement to know what good is. Things are like God or good. He's not like God or not good. So we have this reality to measure and know what's good. The council refers back to perhaps the teaching of God and eternal law. So Augustine defines the eternal law as the region of God, God's own reason, God's own will. Which commands us to respect the natural order of God's God's will creation, God's made, God's done. It'll be disturbed. Thomas Aquinas identifies it with the type of divine wisdom, doing all things to their due end. So God directing the world and things what's best for So God being creator, there was once things to what's what's the best for creatures. So when they, God makes them once they do his best for them. So this is God's wisdom, God's will, guiding things towards the best for them. And God's wisdom is providence, love which, love which cares. He wants to do this because he's bored, because he wants to play around with things, because he loves. God himself loves and cares in the most literal basic sense for all creation. But God provides for man differently from the way in which he provides for beings who can run off persons. He cares by not from without the laws of physical nature, but from within, through reason. Which by its natural laws or by the eternal law is consequently able to show man the right direction right to take his free actions. So God guides us for the best for us by doing what's good and avoiding what's bad. These, these, these choices of, of, of to not sin, not steal, not lie, not cheat is only about being caught or being in trouble or because let's let that in minute who we are. We are miserable when we're liars, when we're thieves, when we're murderers. We're, 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 we're hurt, hurting ourselves. And so God is good, only tells us on the outside, do this, don't do that. Puts it inside here, in our heart, saying, this is what's good, this is what's bad, and live this way. This is how you, and so these two things together have both of these actions. These gifts. In this way, God calls man to participate in his own problems. He desires to guide the world. Not only the world of nature, but also the world of human persons. Through man himself, by reasonable and responsible care. God's given man to of the world that he wants. He wants to be in charge of it, to guide to be stewards of it. So he says, by our choices, do, do what I do, we create the world, make a better place. First of all, make yourself a good person, who's around into the heaven, but it will allow himself to be better, beautiful, and great. That's our job as his creatures, as the stewards of creation. The natural law is here the human expression of God's eternal. So as we live and as we act, as we walk with God, we do what God wants us to do, imitating God, and we do what God does in our own little limited way. When I am kind of around me, when I'm around me with no God in the heaven, care of what God's got to take care of. And imitating God cares for everything. Reflecting God and acting as his child in his creation and his care for the universe. In Thomas writes, among all others, the rational creature is subject to divine providence, the most excellent one. Insofar as it partakes of the share of providence, being providential for itself and for others. Not only for myself, but also care for my spouse, my children, friends, family, and even to a certain extent the creatures around the plants, the animals, the world, all of Thus, I have a share of eternal reason. Natural nation act through proper act of that. Mm -hmm. Its participation in the eternal law of the natural creature is called natural. Try to get through one more, or should we stop there? Mom. More? Okay. Four to four. Five. 
The church has all made reference to this is doctrine of natural law. Including in our own teaching on, on morality, the free choice of living back. Thus, a better predecessor, not mine, double the second, be the 13th, <laughs> emphasized that essential subordination of reason to human law was the God of his wisdom. If they're stating that natural law is written and engraved on the part of each and every man, there's nothing else than the human reason itself commands to be willing to count this law to sin. Neither the thirteenth appeals to the higher reason of the divine law. This prescription of human reason not under the force of law, thus it was a voice the Jupiter of some higher reason, which our spirit freedom must be subject. A law has to have, has to be something that needs to be a lawmaker. I can't make law for myself or for those around me. So in order for it to truly be law, it has to be a lawmaker and a lawgiver who is ready to real. The, the force of law consists in some authority to impose duties, to confer rights, and the same certain behavior. All this clearly cannot exist in man if, as well as a legislator, he himself will do actions. They include it. It follows the natural law in itself, the eternal law. The plan of being that would reasonably find them toward their right and action end. It's nothing else the eternal reason of the creator of the universe. So the behavior of God gives us some whispers in our hearts, some shadow of creation. You're going back to a man of their lives. That we reflect God, this lets us then know what's right and wrong, because we're imitating God in our actions in our life and how we live. Does that make sense? Okay. So I'm just thinking of some further browse, I'm sure this is good. You're pondering the beauty of this. Because you don't know what's supposed to be said. I've never heard the ontological argument for law. <laughs> <laughs> so. Pope Leo XIII. Yes, he was Pope 1890 to 1903. No, sorry. Let me go back. 1876 to 1903. Um, yes. Because. He was one longer the post. So 18, yeah. It was, yes. <laughs> when I was 18, I checked, but it's my other Bible. My other Bible has all the posts on the front page. Oh, no. <laughs> Not this one. Leo. It's warm, too. She himself carries out by his reason, particularly by his reason enlightened by divine revelation and by faith. Through which law, through the law which God gave to the people, beginning with the Baptist Sinai. So, to help us, we have our reason, we also have our revelation. We, we have what God holds in our minds here to figure out, I should have killed people, I should have still should have lied. We also have God tell us these things so we know it more clearly. Now, if you want to kill, if you want to steal, shut up, you're all witness, be in love. Israel was called to accept and to live on God's law as a particular gift inside of the collection of the divine covenant, the pledge of God's blessing. But part of what Israel did to become God's people, that to the love of God, to be the Messiah about itself, was to live like God, act like God, imitate God, and to share God's law. And when Israel talks about the law, it's not simply this external thing which God has forced them to do. This transformative reality makes them like God, and if it lets them become God's people. But as Moses could address the children of Israel and ask them, What relation is there is a God who looks very late? The Lord our God has trusted and called upon him. And it is said that stacks ordinances to righteous as all this law, which I said before you this day. In the Psalms, we encounter the sentiments of praise, gratitude, and veneration. So the people had for them. 
together with an exhortation to know it, ponder it, and translate it into life. Blessed is the man who walks on the counsel of the wicked, or stands in the way of sinners, or sits in the way of sinners, scoffers, this light is the law of the Lord, his life is day and night. The law of the provided the soul, the testament of the Lord is sure, making the wise simple. The priests of the Lord are right towards the heart, and what is pure right in the eyes. In other words, we follow God's law as commands, not simply okay to obey God, I'm not going to spank us. But as I become, I become happy, I become true, I become good, I become wise, I become enlightened, I become great in my God. I share the very life and happiness of the living God. This is a very highly different thing, simply, if I don't to do what's bad about the passion. The church gratefully accepts and lovingly preserves the entire cause of revelation. Treating it with religious respect and feeling permission of a participant authentically, they're being God's law and by the gospel. In addition, the church receives the gift of the new law, which is the fulfillment of God's law, which is Christ and the Spirit. This is an interior law. The development of the spirit of the living God on tablets of stone or tablets of human hearts. Right, so we have, it's almost like it says before, earlier, you're saying it again in a way. We have the reason, revelation, and now the new law, we have a union with God and share God's own life. Where God has given us His grace, God has given us His spirit, and now we can know through God's grace, through God's spirit. We take the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, which right now is good and bad, which make what's going to be joyful and lightning, making the wise, making this good, making this whole. We now have this interior part of ourselves that doesn't add to the checklist, but is this ever expanding greatness more and more like God. This is the law of perfection, freedom, and law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. And Thomas writes, this law can be called law in two ways. First, the law of the Spirit of the Holy Spirit, the dwelling in the soul, the teaching it also is necessary to do, by telling us what must be done in our minds. It also implies the will to act with rights. Secondly, the law of the Spirit can be called the proper effect of the Holy Spirit, and thus faith work with the law. Because everybody that things to be done can find the effect of this act. Was God telling us what to do and also by helping us to love us? Love us. Because I love God, I act like God, I be like God, I imitate Him, but I live with Him forever. It's not simply being in the same place with God, but mm -hmm. heaven is being becoming like God, and living His life, walking with Him, and sharing His life. But by living that now, by my actions and my choices, but what I know is good, how am I going to be with God forever? My heart is different than God's. Heart is rebellious to God, to God. So my moral life, moral choices, was more and more like my morals. What we live with every day. Even though moral laws of reflection distinguishes usually between the positive, what's called the real law of God, the natural law, and also distinguishes between the consolation of all the new law. It was only for God, these and other useful distinctions always refer to that law as often as the one that said God is always meant for man. So it means to divide it up in different parts, but always it is back to the same person, it's always from the same person, it's always for the same purpose. Not separate things that we, we, we need the division, God doesn't. The different ways in which God acted in history tears the world for mankind, not mutually exclusive. But the confidence of each other intersect. They have their origin and their goal, the beginning and the purpose, Alpha and Omega. The eternal wine, love and counsel of God, destined man and woman, in the form of the image of the Son. God's plan was no threat to man's any freedom, contrary to the acceptance of God's plan to play with firm life. Go back to, again, our freedom, the purpose of being with God. In many ways, you can take this letter and say it in one, one sentence. Right? I mean, maybe three. <laughs> but, yeah. God is the source of law. Do that. Amen. 
right? And then this expands one, it's pulling apart, it's showing the ways to look at it. It's the same, the same thing in various ways. Good. Questions, comments? All right, let's close with a prayer. We'll pick it up then next week on um, Forty-six. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for giving us your law. We imitate you in all things, love you above all things, and follow you in all ways. God that we say and do we fear glory. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. Almighty God bless you, the Father and the Son.